So today I'm excited. I've got Liza with me and we're going to talk about for loops and we're going to provide some examples in C. Welcome back everybody. Today I've got Eliza with me. She's helping me out. This is a video for the beginners out there. Specifically, we're talking about for loops. Now, I don't know if this is just because of the way that it's often explained or if people just don't really fully understand for loops, but it seems to give beginners more trouble up front than I expect. So today I thought we would break down the for loop, what it is, how it works, and some of the things that might throw people just a little bit if they're learning this for the first time. And hopefully by the end of the video, you'll see that they're actually really simple. But before we get into it, one request, just if you're getting, if, if you're enjoying these videos, if you are enjoying this content, if you're getting value out of it, I hope that you'll find some way to help support this channel, especially big thanks to all of you who support this channel on Patreon, where you can get access to my office hours and source code from all the videos. Also liking, subscribing, and just like clicking stuff helps a lot. Okay, enough, enough with the YouTube stuff. Let's talk about for loops. Okay, and for this, let's just jump straight into the code. Okay, so for today's video, I'm assuming you've probably seen basic while loops before, but maybe just a quick refresher, right? You've seen them, right, Liza? I have seen those. <laughs> okay. So basically a while loop is going to look something like this, you know, while a condition and then, yeah. So the idea is really simple as long as, or while this condition, whatever we put in here is true. Whatever's in the curly braces will, will run. Yes. Whatever's in the curly braces will run. Yep. So it's going to keep doing whatever I put down in here, whatever code we put down in here, it's going to do that over and over again, as long as whatever I put here is true. So if I said something, let's say I've got some variable, you know, a, as long as a is greater than five or something, it will just keep doing this. Okay. Now, one thing that we often do with loops is let's say that we have some array up here. We'll call it my values. And let's say that we have some array size like this. We'll come up here and we'll just make a const int array size, something like that, and set it equal to six. Does that work? <laughs> 400? 400. <laughs> you want 400. Yes. Okay. 400. Got to pick a fun number. <laughs> and then say that we wanted to go through, you know, a really common thing. We have this array and a really common thing is maybe we want to print out all of the entries in this array. I want to print out all of the values. And I do think we should go up and make this a little smaller just so oh, that we on. can. <laughs> well, I want to be able to initialize it. I want to be able to come up here and say like equals, you know, one, two, three, four, something like that. You're dulling my sparkle. <laughs> I'm sorry. Whatever. But so if I do want to print out all of the elements of this array, then what we can do is maybe we declare a variable. Let's call it index and set it equal to zero, right? And then we could say, well, this index is going to basically, it's basically going to keep track of our location in the array. And so maybe we'll say as long as index is less than array size, then we could come down here and we could do something like print F and we'll print out an integer. Actually, let's do two just for kicks so we can get both the index. So we'll get the index and we will get the value corresponding to, not hooray, my <laughs> values and index. Okay, and then the only other, next thing we have to do is we just have to say index plus plus, or you know we just want to take index and increment it by one, right? So pretty straightforward. This is this is something that that hopefully is pretty obvious to most people. Um, also one thing that you may not have realized is a lot of times people just use i for this when you're just looking at an index in an array. You know that might not be obvious. People are like, why does everybody always use i? It's it's short for index. And later on, I guess in fact, why not just to make the code a little bit you know a little bit shorter we can do that right here. And this is one of the few cases where a- I forgot to change the last one. <laughs> okay. See, this is why Liza's here. She's here <laughs> to make sure that I don't make dumb mistakes every, on my video. Every time he does make dumb mistakes, I will make fun of him. Okay, perfect. So, but yeah, so I is just shorter and it's one of the few times where it's not bad coding style to have a one character variable because pretty much universally people understand if you've got I at some index, right? So pretty straightforward. Although somebody's not gonna like that I said that. Somebody's gonna be like, no, you gotta spell it out, <laughs> but that's okay. Okay, so we've got our array right here and it's basically just gonna go through our array and print out all the values. In fact, let's come down here and just run it really quick. Whoa, that was bigger than I expected. Large terminal. <laughs> so if I just use my make file to compile this, 
check out my make videos if you haven't seen make before. If this is confusing, it's pretty simple, but um, then all we would do is come in down here with example and you can see it prints out all of the entries in my array, right? Pretty straightforward, not a big deal. But the thing is, is this is a really common pattern. This is something that we do so often that we've actually created the for loop because it basically addresses this case, right? Mm -hmm. So its purpose is to make a particular type of loop that brings all of these elements that are super common all up into the head of the array. Okay, so instead, what I'm gonna do here is we'll just, just comment this out so you can still see that it's here. And then we're gonna come down here and basically what we're gonna do Dude, is- give yourself an enter. You're cramping it. Okay. And then what I'm gonna do is say four. And then in here, we're going to move this guy right here, right? So we're gonna move that in there. And then we move our condition down in here. And then this increment, basically the thing we want to have happen after the loop is done, we move over here. Semicolon. Yes, I am gonna delete the semicolon. And then if we move our printf here, okay. And so basically this for loop here is the equivalent of this code up here. It's a little bit shorter, but it might not be super obvious to everybody. Sometimes people see this and they may not fully understand what it's doing. And the, before we get into some of that, I just want to make it clear that the for loop is really, it's what we call syntactic sugar. Have you heard that term before? No, I haven't. So basically Basically, the idea with syntactic sugar is it means we don't really need for loops at all, right? We could do everything that we need to do in any of our programs with while loops, right? We can totally make everything work with just while loops. We don't, it's not like without for loops, we can't program. We can't do something that we want to do. It's just really here to make things a little cleaner. I do think there is a problem because this is the very basic, the very basic for loop. And I think so many beginners um, I TA'd for a beginner's class last semester, so I kind of saw this. A lot of beginners get this guy in their head, and then the minute you ask them to use a for loop differently, they get all mixed up and confused. Like if you're ever trying to like, I don't know, not start I at zero, it's a it's a whole thing. Yeah, so I absolutely. Think, I think that's one of the big problems that beginners have with for loops. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And we're definitely gonna talk about that. So yeah, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to bring it up. One of the reasons that I think it kind of confuses people is that there's all these parts here, and sometimes new students basically just say, okay, if I want to iterate through an array, I just memorize this idiom, this, you know, int i equals zero, i minus whatever the number of the thing I'm going to count up to, and then I plus plus. And so that just becomes like a memorized thing that they just stick into their programs. But what happens if I want to count down or if I want to do something else that's fancier or not fancy, but just different. Mm -hmm. And and this is really easy to do also, I just want to point out, because I find in, in practice that about 98% of the for loops I write actually do look just like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, there's it's a reason why it's the one you learn first. You know, you've got a counter, you've got an index, you, you, know, you, you have your index here, you have your condition and you have some kind of, and you have an increment. So of course today, because we don't want people just memorizing and regurgitating, we want to just talk about some of the other stuff that we can do and make sure that it's clear what is actually happening. Okay. So there are three parts, right? This first part is simply the stuff that we're going to do before the looping starts, right? Before the first time through the loop, this code runs. This tells us this is how long we're going to loop. We're going to loop as long as this is true. Also note that true in C basically just means not zero. So you can have arithmetic expressions in here that might not, you might not think of as a Boolean expression, but is basically going to interpret if the value of that expression is not zero, it's going to be true. Otherwise it's going to be false. Are you going to do an example? That uh, we absolutely can. We should. Okay. We should. Because that, um, the whole like true is not zero is a little confusing. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's take a look. <laughs> so let's do mix things up just a little bit and let's look at, you know, first thing that I want to do that's just slightly different is what would happen if we wanted to try to, uh, let's say iterate backwards. Iterating backwards. <laughs> Why do you hate iterating backwards? Like, because I always somehow manage to get an off by one error and like ruin everything. <laughs> okay. So when you say off by one error, are you are you going too many times? It's always like, too many times. Okay. So you're always going like, too far. Yes. And then if you, I get if you an, go backwards. Yeah, and then I get an out of bounds because I'm. Okay. You know. So if you are like Eliza and you always go too far, then let me give you an advice. Sort of the the first and probably easiest way to not screw up when you want to go in reverse is to actually leave the for loop up here exactly the same. So you just leave it like this, right? Mm -hmm. But then down here, rather than just taking I, you know, the ith element, instead what we do is you actually just take, you take the ith backwards. 
Oh yes, this is what I do because I hate setting I to anything except for zero. So you would do something like this, you know, yeah. array size minus I, minus one minus I. Mm -hmm. So that's going to basically just count backwards. Yeah, no, I do that in basically all of my projects because I, I don't enjoy, I don't enjoy I being, starting at any sort of Yeah, so I actually think this is a really nice way to make sure, you know, if you're comfortable with this and if you find that you're messing things up when you try to mix things up in, in the header, this is a perfectly fine way to do it. So let's look also how, let, let's say we didn't want to do it this way, right? Let's say we're better at counting than Eliza. <laughs> okay, so let's say that instead we, we want to just like keep this as just the index, but we want to use these three elements of our for loop to actually count backwards. Okay, then what are we going to do? So instead we don't want to start zero, we want to start at our last element of our array, the last index in our array. And so we do something like this, array size minus one, right? We're going to start there and then we're going to loop as long as we are greater than or equal to zero, as long as i is greater than or equal to zero, and then up here, i minus minus, right? Yeehaw. Does that look okay? Yeah, no, that looks that looks good. Okay, let's just make sure, because I don't know that I always trust myself. But if we come here, you can see, yeah, we, we did it right, we iterated backwards, brilliant. So this is just another way to kind of mix things up. So we'll leave this in here so that you can see, but let's also look at some other ways that we can vary things, okay? So the first one I wanna look at here is, let's say that I did some something like this really quick. Um, let's just, we'll just scrap this whole thing and just do something just a little different, right? So let's come in here and say A equals zero, uh, B equals one, and then C. And then we're gonna say B is less than 100. And I'm intentionally not explaining why I'm doing what I'm doing because I actually want you to stop and think about actually what's happening here. Okay, so then- Don't figure it out. Okay, I'm not gonna run it. I'm gonna let you figure out what's going on. But then down here, we're gonna print out one and we'll print out B. Okay, so here's kind of a messy for loop, but based on what I've just taught you, take a second to just see if you can tell what this is doing. So pause the video while Liza's thinking about it, try to work it out in your head and then continue. I hate the Fibonacci sequence, <laughs> I should have known. Yep, Ugh. yep, you got it. Everybody, hopefully everybody else got it too. Yes, this computes the Fibonacci <laughs> sequence, basically all of the elements of the Fibonacci sequence that are less than 100. <laughs> I'm right. sorry, Liza. <laughs> he knows how much I dislike the Fibonacci seats. And and things here, <laughs> and yes, I do. <laughs> and things here, basically, they might look odd to you. This for loop might look really odd, but let's just break it down and look at what's going on. You know, all I really did here is in the, the code before we get started is I added a few extra variables, right? So I have this A, I have this B, which I'm gonna start as one. And I also have this C, which I don't actually need to, to initialize because it's gonna get set up. You know, I'm not, I'm using it to keep track of the history, right? And then I still have my condition here. I'm basically gonna go as long as B, which is the thing I'm printing out, as long as that is less than 100. And then each time through, I basically am storing, I'm saving saving the value of A, that first one in C, I'm saving the value, basically you know, moving the value of B to A, and then I'm B becomes basically what the value of A was plus the value of B, right? So we're adding the previous two elements and then that keeps the body of the loop really simple and we just, we just print it out, right? Gross. <laughs> And of course, just to make sure, just so you can see how this actually works, if we come, whoa. <laughs> if we come down here, and we compile it, you can see that it actually compiles. And if we run it, then you can see sure enough that, well, I mean, we, we get our, our iteration up here, but then we get our Fibonacci sequence down here, all the way up to 89. And one thing just to make sure that everyone's following is if we take this back, let's look at the while loop version of this, right? Just just so you can see what's going on, is this is the exact same as me saying int a equals zero. Well, here, I'll just, let's just copy it, copy it here, and then saying while b is less than 100, and then move this into here. And then we take all of these things right here and add them right here. And we will just probably make it a little easier for everyone to follow. So you basically have um, two variables that are the ones you're adding together and a place and something that just holds the value of the previous one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm basically I'm, I'm adding more complex variables for this type of iteration. 
It's just whether or not I wanna have them be separate like this or whether I want to mash them all up into the header of a for loop. And of course, this might be a good time to talk about which one of these is better. The for loop does take fewer lines, like it's more compact, but I do find that at some point, as my for loop gets more and more complicated, it gets to a point where the while loop starts to become easier to read. Yeah, Mr. Don't Write Clever Code. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, I knew I was gonna get that. And uh, so thank you for being here just for that. But I guess one thing I wanna point out is that where that line is, where the line between, when, when your code starts to become too clever, that is a little fuzzy. Different people disagree. Some would say that this Fibonacci loop has already crossed it and they're probably right. It is getting a little harder to follow for sure, but I've definitely seen for loop enthusiasts create far less readable loops. And so it's a judgment call and I'll leave that judgment up to you and your teams. How do you earn the title for loop enthusiast? <laughs> uh, <laughs> when, you've been, when you've been around as long as I have in this field, you'll start to meet people. You'll know them when you see them. They have a, like a distinctive appearance. <laughs> they have a distinctive programming style. <laughs> for loop enthusiasts, yes, you will you will spot them. You'll know them when you see them. So should we show an example where we have a uh, non-Boolean expression? Yes. So we, we talked earlier about how, you know, like we talk about these conditions being something that is a Boolean expression, like I is greater than zero, right? So interestingly, I can actually just delete this. I understand that this works, but I hate it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is also a readability issue and I don't recommend actually doing this, but if we run this, it's basically going to say as long as I, well, so this is gonna be a little problematic because be, before we did, I is greater than or equal to zero, right? This is now the same as like I is greater than zero. Right. Right, so if I take this off and I okay. just say I, right? So let's let's just run this and we can look at it. Then you see if we go up here that basically it does count down, but it misses the, mm -hmm. the first one. It doesn't actually, it stops before it gets to the first one, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there are situations where if you wanted it to start, stop when it hits zero, you know, which in this case we didn't, we actually really do want it to be uh, including zero, but yeah, you totally could just have a numerical value and have it count mm -hmm. down and then stop when it hits zero. Is there any place where that's like actually what people want to do? Because it just seems like, I don't know, it doesn't seem like the ideal for loop situation. Yeah, so the most common place that I see this show up is when you're actually looking at the return value. So a lot of your functions, a lot of your standard C functions return numerical values. Right. And some of them, like let's say things like if I'm reading from a file or maybe I'm reading from a network socket or something like that, those functions, they're gonna return a numerical value. Often like a read is gonna return the number of bytes read, mm -hmm. right? So I might say something like while and just put this function in there, you know, mm -hmm. while read, and it's just gonna iterate as long as I'm getting something from it. And as soon as I return zero, then it bails. Oh, okay. That seems like, that seems like a logical place where you would use that. Yeah, so that's actually, that's a place where that shows up mm -hmm. quite a bit. And it's, it's a place where once you're used to it, the first time you see it, you're like, wait, what does that mean? But then once you get used to that convention, it's really not that confusing. Or if you have like a function that returns zero, if it fails, so you can just do it like run this until it, it fails. Until yeah, it returns zero. absolutely. Okay. Yep. Okay. That said, I normally do advocate. It takes literally three seconds to type an equal sign and a zero. Like it does, it does. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I think that is generally for readability. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to add your equals equals zero or not equals zero to make it really clear that this is what our test is all about. But you're gonna see a lot of people who don't do that and I'm okay with it. Hope you're okay with it. You don't have to be okay with it. But anyway, Anyway, thanks, Liza, for being here with me. I hope that demystifies for loops for you if they were mystical. I hope that helps you understand how they work. And next time you see some big, weird, nasty for loop, at least help you make sense of it. Whether or not it's a good idea to write them yourselves, I'll leave that up to you. Thanks for being here. Like the video, subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And until next week, we'll see you later. Okay. I'm gonna try to decrease the hair volume on camera right now. I thought, you know what? I have to make up for it. Here's <laughs> Mr. Egg over here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you believe we're related?